Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast for Stage 3 of the Tour de France Farm Avec Swift. The most likely sprint stage of the first three stages, with the last 12Ks being pretty much completely flat from Cologne La Rouge to Montignac Lascaux. It is medium mountain beforehand, though, with up and down really all day. Nothing too severe, but... You know, in the first 30 k's, there is like 7 k's of climbing, uh, straight, pretty much back to back, and then it's medium mm-hmm. mountain for the next couple of hours. And then there's also two Category 4s put together, which are about 4 k's of climbing at 5% with 50 k's to go. So it's not like it's pretty, completely flat. And the teams we have here are 2, 4, 6, 7 rider teams, not 8 rider teams. And, you know, SD Works got... Lots of different objectives for different riders. So I thought maybe it wouldn't necessarily be a nailed-on sprint for which Vibas would be the favourite. But what did you see, uh, Benji, once Yeah, what, once TV coverage started or indeed from the race tracker before then? When it comes to the race tracker beforehand, we knew that some attacks had happened at the start. But once again, only a solo breakaway rider up the road, Katrin Hamazov EF. And like, if we take a look at how this race is set up, this is a... A likely sprint finish, like you mentioned. So, Wibis versus Cole. Those are the two teams that, that will most likely try and control in the peloton. So, I want to see every single other team in the attack on the stage. Not necessarily to win from the attacks, but you got to keep in mind, every ride that goes in the break might make it harder for the likes of the SM and SD Works to control the race. And if you take a look at SD Works, they've got mixed goals in this race. Eh? They've got Volring that won't be pacing for the likes of Webus in the first majority of this race. Maybe she she might jump in for a tiny bit of a lead out, worst case scenario. Kopecky, same scenario. So it's kind of up to the other riders to help out. And then you've got a limited amount of domestiques there. DSM has Labu in the same fashion when it comes to uh when it comes to GC, but they have a bit more riders around Charlotte Cole here. So there's about seven, eight domestiques or something in the Peloton that should be used for controlling. Other teams shouldn't be doing anything when it comes to controlling. They should be trying to attack all day long to make it harder for the domestiques of the SM and SD works to make it more likely that their sprinter wins or that they can get something out of the stage in a different way. And we got some attacks. We got to give credit to uh, some riders like the Hummus, for example, that was up the road. There were other attacks that failed initially at the start of the race, like Lebecki went up the road for a bit. She uh, took one point at a KOM at a QM point, but in the end, it it really started kicking off for us when the broadcast started. And when that broadcast started, yesterday, we saw the once famous attack by Yara Kostle and after move of Julie van der Velde. They uh, were fighting for the QM points. Yara Kostle had taken the QM jersey. And today we were at a similar point where we could end up seeing attacks again. And Phoenix was once again the team that was doing it. And i got to give full credit to that team, the way they're handling this. They're like going... Rolling attacks with both, trying to get these QM points, trying to get that jersey. Julie van der Velde is a pretty good climber, I swear. Was it Scandinavia or Norway? I don't know which year it was, where she was top three or top five on like a, a proper a proper mountain finish. I remember her from there as well, but in other races, she's done pretty well when it comes to climbing as well. So she can climb quite all right, but it obviously is for temporary because Tourmalet will probably overtake any points other people yeah. get it. Yeah, these Cat 4s, you know, they're nice for a while, but it, it reminds you it's a lot like Powerless, you know, you're in there and then suddenly you hit the real climbs and bang, the GC contenders have taken it all. But especially as her and Castelline have now shared it across both days and, you know, it's not a cumulative award, but for them it's still a worthy goal to get in the jersey for as long as possible. And now yeah. they have two riders after this stage, first and second in that competition. But yeah, they're on nine and eight points respectively, which... Which shouldn't be enough unless they can sort of get in get in a breakaway that goes all the way almost <laughs> in the next in the next three stages, which I think yeah. would be difficult uh, for them to do. But still, I like them trying it. It's it's a nice goal to have for as long as possible, and who knows what could happen? Maybe yeah, you never know what could happen. But exposure, yeah, yeah it's worth it. You get on the podium every day. Like you're not going to win the race, um, yep. as in the GC overall. So. And also, I was surprised, yeah, just like I know Koshta definitely was trying to get in there, but like realistically, if this goes to a sprint, only two and a half riders can win. Vibas, <laughs> Cool, and Voss on a really crazy weird day. 
if it's been yeah. attritional. Maybe Balsam are being a bit unfair on, but... Not in uh, current form, Little Trek don't have much confidence in her either, and her form's not top. So it really is Vibas or Cole, and... Yeah, there's a lot of other teams here, and it's surprising. And, you know, to see Nivea Dome, I'm not sure if you mentioned her attack, Benji. She attacked, mm -hmm. and I think Marcus attacked earlier. And I'm like, yeah. why are these the riders attacking? Like, yeah. should, why isn't it? I know Skalniak, I don't want to be harsh on Canyon Shram because they actually mm -hmm. haven't quite acted the first two stages, but, like, Nivea Dome is not going 51k solo. With Agreed. Royce chasing her. Like, it's just never happening. And she's a GC contender here. Serious one for the podium. So I was surprised it wasn't a... I don't know. Sk Skalniak, Sh Soika, but she attacked already. I just, there's a lot of other teams, you know, like... Consoni, or Norsgaard, or... Just anyone, really. Grace Brown, like, on FDJ, that... These teams really have no realistic chance to finish, and um, yeah. attacking is your only way to make it. And and SD Works are, are not that strong in break management. They really yeah. aren't. Like they struggled against, I thought, Faulkner in Strata with Kopecky Volering. They got Look six riders. Yeah, like they're not masters of break management. And when it comes to Nivia Doma's attack, I do want to mention the way she did it. I did like, like that was clever. The moment that she did it in this specific stage wasn't going to work as long as she was solo. If Grace Brown was with her and so forth, a three-woman group, then maybe yeah. it goes further. But she basically pretended to sprint for the QM points behind Julie van der Velde, who had taken the points up the road already. Yara Kastlein versus uh, Koster versus uh, Nivia Doma behind is the sprint. And she kind of keeps the sprint going past the QM gate. And people didn't respond from the peloton. They thought like, okay, she's going for the QM points. And I don't know. When I saw her going for it, I knew it was an attack. Like. She doesn't care about the QM jersey if she, <laughs> at no. this point. So maybe other teams could have seen that coming, but maybe they also thought, well, this ain't going anywhere anyway. So, but anyway, we did see someone taking over behind once she had that move. I think Royster was the one to chase her down from the, from the actual Peloton group behind. And then we get towards this like standoff situation between Julie van der Velde, MVP performance up the road. Yeah. One of the riders that really lights up the, the action at that moment. Gets a two minute gap on the peloton where SD Works is full bluffing. They're not working at all. And who falls for it? DSM. I mean, they kind of have to pace though. Like, SD Works already have a stage, they have the yellow mm -hmm. jersey. And DSM got Charlotte a cool here with a train and Labou for GC, maybe top five. Like, they don't have, if they don't chase, then like, I'm pretty sure SD Works would have been like, all right, well, then the break wins. And that's a shame for everybody, but we already won a stage and you, don't ha you haven't won one. And I think DSM also think that Cool, you know, based on UA Tour, has a realistic chance to win the stage, mm -hmm. which is fair enough. We haven't seen in this race Vibas just torch Cool yet, but Vibas did look good in that sprint on stage one in group two, I must say. Um, very dominant. So, yeah, they, it's just a case of. Or you could attack, I guess, with Pfeiffer Georgie. You could go into the attack yourself with Pfeiffer Georgie. That's the that's the only th thing I can think of to call their bluff is yep. to yeah, just go on the attack with Georgie and then force them to use Kopecky earlier. There was a bit of a moment a bit later with 22 kilometers to go. The gap had already gone down a bit from two minutes to roughly 120, 110 at that point. But Kenyon went to the front with the entire team and started pulling an echelon, but nothing really happened. So... That was something. I forgot to mention the intermediate sprint. Van der Velde took the full points in front of uh, a gap. And then Wibis in the peloton took the points in front of Molman, who's still trying. And Kopecky, the position afterwards. Molman is really trying to slip her way into this green jersey, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, I still, I'm surprised she was going for it. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's a lot of energy. Um, but she, I think she's in really good shape. And I'm not sure if she stays in it tomorrow after this sprint. Uh, she does not. Vibas goes into the jersey, uh, quite handily. So she's out of the jersey, even borrowing it tomorrow, anyway. But yeah, it was. It, it just is what it is. I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Van der Velde, I think, showed everybody today the fragility of this chase, and really, yeah. again, kudos to her team, like, and her, Phoenix de Koenig and her for being so strong. Like, she was very, very strong. Looked super athletic and. 
um, it's no easy feat to hold off riders chasing you. And there was a whole team, you know, of ch people chasing her, like DSM controlling. They're a good, they have a good sprint lead out or train. But if she had one more rider with her of equivalent strength yep. or two, it goes to show like they would have had a really tough time controlling her today. I do think, Benji, that like, SD Works still did pace a little bit. Like they still used Chikini and Braid of old and Royce yes, earlier. But I feel like they mainly used them in the final stretch. As in, I feel like they kind of used up DSM, which is clever. It's clever from SD Works to do this. They had worked out, their strategy worked out, and DSM folded and started pacing. And with 5k to go, the gap was kind of going up again from 25 seconds to 35 seconds because the same domestique from DSM had been pacing for the last 15 kilometers, basically. So she's getting, she's getting overworked at that point. She's get overextending and the gap is starting to increase a little bit. And that's when SD Works starts to actually ride themselves. So I feel like the, the timing of them switching over to themselves spacing was good. Chikini then, first rider, Bredewald as next rider. Royster was also kind of calling the shots, as in saying, Chikini, it's time to go to the front, it's Bredewald time. And then Bredewald started pacing and then I, then I felt like it was over for Van der Velde, but she held on so well because it went down to 30 seconds, 20 seconds when Breda World was already pacing, but then it kind of started slowing down and these last one and a half-ish kilometers were kind of cornerish. There were a few corners somewhere and then we see the peloton kind of slow down, a bit better for one rider to slip through. And I was starting to get really worried for the peloton and I started getting really hyped for Julie van der Velde. I was really feeling it. And we entered the last kilometer, I think, with 10 seconds to go and we could see the actual sprinters group in the background but it was also a distance where i was like this may work if if there's one domestique that doesn't take over instantly one yeah. lead out that is kind of like oh i won't lead out yet we want to save ourselves for the final lead out but i think everybody played into the cards of his d works because the way he tracked it sanguinetti for balsamo with like 600 yeah. meters to go even earlier georgie for cole was doing it with 800 meters to go that's all perfection for his D-Works, right? And there's a couple of little uphills in the last K as well that is not welcome when you're on your last legs in a solo breakaway. They, were, they weren't they were great for uh, Van der Velde either. And yeah, the Kopecky lead out for Vibas, they called everyone's bluff. The yellow jersey waited and waited and waited and she didn't hit the wind until she wanted to. And she yeah. does a high-speed lead out past Van der Velde. Uh, for neutral fans, obviously agony, and for Van der Velde and Phoenix de Koenig too. But and you Belgians. know what's coming? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Very sad. I think Lotto Kopecky needs to explain this to the king tonight. King Philip True. will need to have to talk to her because I'm not okay with her taking away the chance of Julie Van der Velde. My heart is broken. It's like when Van Poppel led out Jakobsen at European Championships. <laughs> Why is a Belgian leading out a Dutch rider again? He's not a Belgian, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know what happens next. Kopecky leads out Vibas, and Vibas just absolutely tortures everybody. If she gets a high speed lead out from the best classics rider in the world who just won solo on stage one at that level, then she's very, very difficult to beat. Cool lost a lot of positions, and so in the end, she gets nothing. It was actually uh, Jumbo Visma who brought Voss up, I thought, into quite good position, and she even looked like she was being going to be quite competitive for a while, but yeah, she comes second in the end, just not not able to match the firepower of Vibas, and not surprising in a flat sprint. Uh, to be honest, Kopecky comes third, Consoni fourth, Balsamo fifth, which is actually quite a nice result, uh, given her you know her preparation. Manly sixth, Cole seventh, the SM will be uh, Fermanek will be disappointed with that. Suzanne Anderson, eighth, and there was a split of two seconds, but all the GC contenders were in that split of two seconds, so no no one loses time in respect of GC today. Uh, and yeah, Kopecky keeps the yellow jersey, in fact, takes another four bonus seconds in front of Lippert, so she's got a 55-second gap. And points, Kopecky keeps that 25-point gap over Vibas, who moves up five spots now, so Vibas will be in that jersey tomorrow because Kopecky keeps... Yellow jersey. Uh, Julie van der Velde, small consolation, but one she was probably originally going for, nonetheless, will be in the polka dot jersey uh, tomorrow with her teammate and second. If she doesn't get combativity, then <laughs> something's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> she deserves it after this race, and I hope we can see her up the road again in the coming days, because I feel like Phoenix has really made these races uh, 
more enjoyable than they would have been without them out the road. That's for certain. Their fight for the QOM has been so wonderful to see. And yeah, they didn't win, but they won our hearts, I would say. Oh, just a great blueprint. And, and it's not really a, a new blueprint. Like, it's yeah. not exactly the same, but we also, you know, the way the Olympic road race happened in 2021, of course, Kopecky's not Dutch. I don't get that one wrong, but Vollering was in that team. And you can see what happens if you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen who don't want to be the sous chef. Um, so, yeah, I just, I wish, uh, that's something to talk about tomorrow, Benji. Is tomorrow the day? Uh, from Kaol to Rodez, 178 kilometers long. There's a little 2.2K, 5% Category 3 at the start. So that's got some good... That's got some good points on offer there. That's a, that's a soft Category 3. Uh, there's a, then a, a Category 4, 85Ks in. This is the longest stage of the race, by the way. So again, this is why I really think a break has a good chance. Uh, it would be difficult for SD Works to control. 3Ks, 3.5%. Rolling. And then it's really an Arden finish. This is a hard finish. Like, I really think there should be gaps tomorrow. Category 3, 6.6Ks, 4%. A bonus sprint straight after on an uphill, then 5Ks, 5% at Category 2. No flat, by the way, in any of this. Descent, 2.3K, 7%. That's really hard. Descent and then two punchy climbs, including uphill to the finish. If SD works, if they don't go for Volering tomorrow, Benji, then they deserve to lose GC to Van Vlerten. I also think <laughs> I would be scared if I was them seeing Van Vlerten's lack of punch. I would be scared of that because it reminds me a lot of last year and it would suggest to me that she's done all her focus and training on being good on a 50-minute effort, which is going to yeah. decide this race, or a 30-minute effort in the TT. And they have to go for Vollering tomorrow. They, ha they have to try and take time both in the bonus sprint and in the finish against her and to get a small time gap. On one end, I think so as well, but it wouldn't surprise me if they... If they switch it and eventually end up riding away with Royster on one of the hills or in one of the descents and try and get other people to come out of their shell and it fails to happen and Royster wins the stage instead. That's also a possibility I see on, on the map here on this stage. But I, I agree that they've missed out on, on, was it 10 to 16 bonus seconds, roughly, on stage two. And... I would argue that on this stage, it's another opportunity for Vollering to try and gain time on Van Vleuten. And if they don't do that, then, then they're putting it all on Tourmalet. If they're super confident then Tourmalet, well, if she actually pulls it off, then then okay, then deserve. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. But if, if they don't and they fail there and they fail to take time initially before that race, then we can only say that they missed out beforehand. But I will also say that I kind of feel like the stage will be won by Royster with Lippert winning the sprint behind. Do you reckon it'll be Royster gets her turn to win tomorrow? And they're trying to... I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. I'm going to go with Nuvia Doma. I think Ooh. she looks very... Or at least a longer Borghini, but I think Nuvia Doma. I like the little uphill finish. I yeah. think she looks in fantastic shape. I think this last hour is... Oh, 40 kilometers is really, really difficult. Like, there is a lot of climbing in this back half, and it's the longest stage. 180 Ks. I think it's a really difficult stage. And Nuvia Doma, I mean, I don't think she wasted too much energy today. I think it's actually a positive sign. She was so, you know, ready to go at 50 yeah. Ks to go. And, and these, these short climbs really, really suit her in the finish. So I'm hoping she breaks. Uh, drought. It's been a, yeah, a long drought. She last won a world tour race in 2019. Um, and I'm still Oof. in 2019, and she's better than that. So I think Lippert already broke her three-year drought. It's time for Nuvia Doma to break her drought, and uh, I'd love to see. I would. I'd love to see uh, Paladin and Shabby in the attack, just like they were in the Ardennes. They were very, I thought, quite proactive in the Ardennes. So I'd like to see them in the attack early, going with moves of you know, like a Sprat Benji. Yeah. Like she's not going to win GC, right? So agreed. Even yeah, Lamborghini, was... same scenario. She has, yeah, yeah. But it can't just be the one rider. You got to use, yeah. You you you, you got to try and use your multiple threats here to because yeah. then SD Works. It's like wow, is good because I think I think SD Works uphill look vulnerable, really vulnerable. When Nuvia Doma kicked off yesterday, it wasn't Kopecky closing it down for her. 
was swallowing herself. She doesn't yep. have a premium. She doesn't have a Riolini. So if you if you try and make the race on these medium mountain uphills, she has to close it all herself. Yep. And you can create a situation to really put pressure on her. And Van Vlerten too. It's not just Vollering, but um, so I'd love to see a bit of uh, cohesion between Canyon Shram, Yumbo Visma, DSM, UAE? UAE, Little Trek, Mulman on AG Insurance. I'd love Big to see track. them all gang up on them. <laughs> I feel like when it comes to Nivia Doma, though, that I don't see her winning on the final rise. I see her... Uh, that's why I have difficulties with her winning, because I always see her as the, the rider that can really do it on the, on the rough, really steep, one kilometer climbs, maybe, something like that. There's that, for example, the Côte de la, uh, la Verne, something like that. It's uh, 2.3 kilometers, 7%, roughly, which is the one with... How many kilometers from the finish line? I'm trying to count right now. That's very difficult. I would say it's about 10 kilometers from the finish line. That's rough enough for Nivia Doma to do something. But the final ramp, I'm like, I don't necessarily believe she's going to have the better punch and Lippert on that climb. So she kind of needs to split beforehand. And then she's likely going to be with someone else in my head. That's how I see it. But hey, I hope you're right. Because I want that Nivia Doma draw to end. But um, yeah, it's... If Volring doesn't take time tomorrow, then they're putting it all on Tourmalet. Yeah, I, th I, think, um, I think they have to. And I think, I think it might be so hard that, yeah, like I don't mind Royce going on the attack. I think that's actually a good aggressive defensive strategy to make others chase. I don't mind that. But um, yeah, Volring really needs to, I think, get, get moving now. Maybe I'm being too nervous and they got the data and they know she'll just torch Tourmalet. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm not... I'm worried about nothing. Um, but I think AVV and Movistar, I think they're quite comfortable with how this race has gone so far. Yeah. Stage win, same time Vollering and Van Vleuten, I think they're pretty comfortable with how it's all going. Uh, yep. But we'll see tomorrow. It, I think it would, should really kick off. Maybe, maybe a break forms on that first Cat 3. And after Van der Velde went so deep today, uh, it would need to be the right break with multiple riders working well together. But maybe Brown and, and Koshta and, and other riders also take confidence from Van der Velde today and they go on that uh, early cap I've three. lost hope. I hope they I've do. I've lost all hope in the breakaways. I don't believe yeah. anymore. You don't I believe? feel like the... It's always a one-woman up the road situation. And if they keep doing that, then it's never going to work out. So... There needs to be more in so far. I've not seen it, so I've lost hope at this point. Except for keys enough for goat. Yeah, that's true. But she was originally <laughs> in a break of five or seven, right? It was yeah. not a break originally of one. Um, exactly. I want Schweinberger on the road. Marta she's Lock good. up the road. I want. Where'd she come? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't check. Yeah, Christina Schweinberger came fifth on stage two. For sure, they uh, and Phoenix de Koenig. I reckon she should get in the break. She looks really strong. She's been and strong the, all season, by the way, Schweinberger. Yeah, Austrian champ, I think she is. So now maybe she's too good and she tries to get in the break like late. You know how Van der Velde got created a break late? So maybe yeah. they use the first climb to get in the breakaway um, the, in, in, in the final, the first, first climb in the last hour and a half. I don't know, but yeah. I, I'm really excited to see it. Uh, but yeah, Vibers wins today. She does what she does. Back-to-back -back years winning a stage in this race. And SD works now... Um, we haven't really discussed. So the Capecchi flat tire from yesterday, that was not <laughs> that flat. Come on. So like, if you've seen, first of all, if it's a slow lick and she's lost a bit of pressure, there's a huge advantage. Well, not huge, but there's an advantage to having that in the wet conditions in that run in anyway. Yeah. For the grip. And second of all, like if you depress a three bar, it might, because it might have been at four bar in the morning. If you depress a three bar or for people that use normal pressures, you know, 35 psi, 30 psi tire. It will with thirty. Like you put your thumb on it, depress a fair amount. But like that tire didn't really have much rebound in it. I was like, is that really that flat? <laughs> so I don't believe it was a flat tire. Flat tire is the wrong term for it. She called it in an interview a leg loper, which is kind of like when your tire starts losing pressure. That's slowly. kind of it. So slow leak, basically. And then the social media manager put on Twitter that she had a flat tire. So. That's already a wrong translation, but then Volring started using flat tire on her Instagram. So I would at this point, they're trying mistake. to sell a story that is a flat tire. It's not a flat tire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, borrowing the Jakobsen, <laughs> borrowing the Jakobsen playbook. Um, 
<laughs> Luke won't like that. Anyway, <laughs> other news, uh, less fortunate news. This dropped just as this stage was finishing. Actually, the UCI just released it. They have provisionally suspended uh, Miguel Angel Lopez. This has kind of been bubbling along in the background for a long time. They're, they're currently, for background, there is currently a, a Spanish anti-doping investigation into yeah. Dr. Marcos Minar, which is in conjunction with Spanish police, Guardia Civil, which is how all these things usually get done is police. Um, and anyway, first Lopez was called as a witness to this, the investigation into Minar. And then he was somehow connected to it himself. And then it appeared that he was a client of Minar. And then it got a bit murkier, murkier, and murkier. And now, but there was no anti doping rule violation yet. But now, based, this is now from the UCI statement, I'll read it out. Based on an investigation conducted by the ITA, that's the International Testing Agency, including evidence in, obtained by the Guardia Civil and Spanish anti-doping organization during the investigation to Marcos Minor. The UCI has today notified Miguel Angel Lopez of a potential anti-doping rule violation. They've notified him of a potential ADRV. After review of the information and material provided by the ITA on 26 June and 7 July, the Colombian writer has been notified of a potential ADRV for use and possession of a prohibited substance in the weeks prior to the Giro 2022. Remember, he abandoned mm -hmm. the Giro 2022, I think, after the Etna stage or during. Um, when he was, yeah, bad on Etna. Um, the UCI has decided to provisionally suspend the rider pending the final decision. Since 1 January 21... Yeah, no further comment. That's all that's relevant. Um, it's weird. Maybe I'm a bit rusty, Benji, but mm -hmm. usually it's like you get an ADRV and you just get suspended. But I guess they're waiting for the IT. They must have such firm evidence from the ITA. They, they don't want this guy doing world championships. This is what this yeah. says to me. They, yeah. There's so much smoke from the ITA that sh to show the UCI. They're like, fuck, we can't have this guy do world champs when we're, we're going to give him a, a proper sanction yeah. like a week after. I think that's why this has come out. I think so as well. And... Like when it comes to Lopez, they just announced their team with him included for Colombia. So yeah. it, it was meant to be him at the World Championship. So he's not going to be there as a consequence, uh, as a consequence of the suspension. Now, I swear I read something about all the things that might have led to this ages ago about what might have went down at the Giro when it comes to Lopez. But I'm not sure if that story has been 100% confirmed. So I don't want to shout it out and maybe slander the guy either. But it's looking like the story might actually be... A, be turning to being a true story and i think it's a good thing that he's caught if that's the case yeah and i wonder uh, there was a swanure as well um yeah i think on the astana team whether they were fired or not i think they were let i think go. yes um but yeah he dnf the etna stage so but this is only in relation to use before before the giro so maybe yeah. maybe they have some documentation that they now know that that was present that possession was present before the Giro to be used during the Giro, something like that. Just throwing out Strauss yeah. here. Yeah. Anyway, um, I dare say the final sanction or decision from the IT and the UCI will come out uh, in the coming weeks or months. But yeah, he's been provisionally suspended, and this will also for sure mean that I mean him and Quintana are already basically blacklisted from all the World Tour and Pro Conti teams because. Like, their performances are obviously very good. Like, if you look at Lopez's performance this year, the guy's won every race, um, doing yeah. huge, huge numbers. Like, Lopez right now, this year, however he's done it, he's a top, top 10 climber in the world, at worst, at worst. And so he already was, all the other teams weren't touching him. Um, yeah. And this basically means, for sure, no team will be, like, trying to take him to the Vuelta if they want to, you know, give him a, a contract. and. But Quintana is a separate issue. Quintana is very different in that we know everything, or at least we think we do, about Quintana. It's done. Quintana used Tramadol in the Tour de France on yeah. two stages. He had his Tour de France results just uh, annulled. Arkea terminated his contract. It's not an anti-doping rule violation at the at, at present, but he's still on the blacklist. Um, I don't know whether that will change. 
uh, for the Vuelta. There's so many rumors, of course, but I can't see it changing too soon either, him. But it's too di it's actually quite different, the, the two cases. And when it comes to the Quintana case, a lot of people start throwing around uh, the fact that a lot of teams are part of the NPCs for a C, for example, and therefore can't sign riders that have been in contact with Alexis Tramadol before. I don't actually know if that's a rule by I the NPCC. I don't think that's true. But I don't mind that being a rule by the MPCC. If you're in the MPCC, then you might as well hold yourself to that in the first place. Otherwise, you're just in it to pretend you're according to that rules, in my personal opinion. Now, if you're not in the MPCC and you end up signing Quintana, you're not doing anything illegally. But I do think you're going to have some reputation loss. Yeah, maybe. Um, probably, yeah. But in the end, some of these teams are about to get uh, could get relegated. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> if your team doesn't exist, then there's no <laughs> reputation to protect. That's the, but that's the unfortunate. I'm joke, but it's a sad. It's a tough quandary to be in. Um, that you might want not want to take a risk. But yeah, it's clear that Quintana also has the level to be on a team. But teams are deciding, yep. yeah, it's not worth it. Okay, that. Maybe it's a good thing. Teams like, okay, yes, it's not technically a doping violation, but this guy used something that wasn't allowed. He got mm -hmm. in the biggest race of the year. And by the way, very expensive tests. So I would very much doubt that they are doing tramadol testing at minor races. It is very, very expensive, those tests, especially as it's not a it's not a technically yet an anti-doping product. It's a it's on the for the rider's health product. I believe the UCI wanted to yeah. go on the do the doping list, and it will be soon. Yeah, but that's up to WADA, I think. I think, uh, and yeah, they've announced, like it's not worth it. I think WADA has announced that it will be on the list in was it 2024, 2025? Yeah. I remember an article by Reuters uh, last year that that was going to be changing. Which, if that's the case, then I think a lot of people should just avoid trying to sign Quintana as a consequence of that either, because otherwise you're just signing someone that took something that will be on the ban list in a year. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, well, lots of people took it. In the 20 yeah. teens. Uh, but it wasn't banned then. So that's, that's, that's a separate discussion. Um, but anyway, that was news today. Uh, kind of curious timing, but I think it's, uh, I think the UCI, yeah, they've seen enough. Obviously, they've seen enough strong evidence from the ITA and from that uh, investigation, and they've suspended Lopez provisionally. And we'll wait for further news. But anyway, that's all from us today. We'll see you with the recap of Stage 4 tomorrow. Hopefully it's carnage. We're looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, we'll see you then. Till then, ciao.